Hello and welcome back to the Glenscope channel where today we're taking a look at episode 3 in our Bill Blair review series. Today he is being interviewed by a fellow Liberal MP, Nathaniel Eskrin Smith, MP for Beaches East York. It's actually notable that Nathaniel is the MP and he was the MP during the time of the Danforth shooting. So we'll go into that in a little bit. So with that, I'll have Nathaniel do the intro. Welcome to Uncommons. I'm your host, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith. On this episode, I'm joined by Public Safety Minister Bill Blair as part of a series of episodes where we're going to focus on gun violence, including an upcoming episode with Ken and Claire Price, whose daughter was in the Danforth shooting. Thank you, Nathaniel. So I just wanted just to bring up a little bit about the Danforth shooting for anyone who doesn't know. It happened in 2018. In Danforth, um, the person in front of me basically walked up the main street and started shooting a handgun into a restaurant and two people were killed and 13 people were injured before police arrived and killed the gunman. In gun control in Canada, there has been a lot of misinformation already about this and some questions about this certainly in my community, your community, we want to see stronger gun control. What, what's the nature of this announcement? Give us some specifics of what happened a week ago. Yeah, a couple of background things, Nate. You know, you know, and I think most of uh, the people in our communities know, I spent most of my life trying to keep people safe. And, and I very strongly believe that there is so much more we can do to... So what Bill Blair here is doing is he's called framing. He's going to frame the next 40 minutes of this interview under the first 30 seconds. He is the safety minister. He's there to keep you safe. Any action they take, it's there to keep you safe. Regardless of what may happen or whatever stats is is actually occurring it doesn't matter they have good intentions we made a very significant move as we had promised to do we when we campaigned last year and you'll remember as we campaigned we promised people we were going to prohibit assault rifles in in our in our country bill you got to pace yourself with the lies you got to actually have a little bit of truth in there to actually sort of establish your base this is a lie because the liberals did not ban assault rifles on may 1st 2020 and to be clear, the legal definition, and it is a legal definition, of an assault rifle is an uh, assault rifle is a select fire rifle that uses an intermediate cartridge with a detachable magazine. And select fire means is either burst or automatic fire capable. If it's semi-automatic only, that is not a that is not an assault rifle. And let's take a look at just a little bit of history on the firearms re regulation in Canada. Automatic firearms were added to the category of firearms that had to be registered in 1951. And then fully automatic firearms were banned, with an exception to current owners in 1977. So the only people that could be owners of legal fully automatic firearms have had these weapons for 70 years? Do you know how many crimes have been committed with owners of fully automatic firearms in Canada? Because it's zero. So if that was an issue, we would have seen something present itself in the last 50 to 70 years. You know, there, are, there has been an incredible proliferation over the last 20 years of weapons that weren't designed for hunting or for sport shooting. They were designed for soldiers to kill soldiers. They were designed for military use in combat. And, and those weapons are very efficient because they are capable of rapid su sustained uh, fire. They're very efficient at killing people. Designed to, to kill people, Firearms designed for soldiers killing soldiers. Now, Bill Blair, I understand that you may have the best intentions in trying to keep Canadians safe, because you also mentioned that at the beginning. But the issue is, is that the bottom rifle, the AR-15, when you say it was designed for soldiers killing soldiers, well, sort of. It was more selected because it was lighter and it was cheaper than the rifle they had before, not because it was any less deadly. And to reiterate the point, the rifle at the top is completely legal. It fires the same bullet, and it's semi-automatic as well. Why are we not making laws based on the functionality of the firearm? If it can accomplish the same task, then it doesn't really matter what it was originally designed for, right? For example, like, I have a hammer, right? It's to hammer nail. It doesn't... It doesn't matter what what color the grip is or what it's what it's made of, if it's wood or plastic or carbon fiber or whatever. It doesn't really matter. If I can still hammer hammer nails, it's still gonna work. And if you ban like a, like a carbon carbon fiber handle, well, again, 
it will still work. So is anyone less safer with having like no carbon fiber hammers while like wooden wooden hammers are fine? That's basically what you're saying is like we can't have assault hammers basically, but we can still have hammers. Intended to be killed people and tragically in this country, we have seen people who are intent on mass murder at Ecole Polytechnique where 14 women were, were killed. I remember I, when I was a kid, I, I, my mom would take us to vigils for the white ribbon campaign in the wake of the Montreal massacre and to attend those as a kid and then many years later be the MP that lost uh, con constituents and lost a young liberal in the course of the Danforth shooting. It hits very- The main issue with these mass, mass shootings like the Moss shooting in Quebec like the Danafor shooting, which was again an, an illegal weapon, the Nova, Nova Scotia shooting, which was again a bunch of illegal weapons from the US. With all of these instances, these new laws that they just implemented on May 1st or any of the previous laws for the last 50 years didn't make a difference. So we're kind of in this cycle of insanity where we're making new laws to solve problems that the old laws should have solved in the first place. Do not allow yourself to be tricked into this victim mentality. The idea that, oh, a new law will make us safer. The old laws are very strict. They didn't make anyone safer. It didn't stop any of these mass shootings. There's very little public support for these types of weapons, but for the people who make their living selling them, they're having a little bit of trouble getting much public support. Because overwhelmingly, Canadians can see there's no real public value into these things. And, and, and all our polling indicates well over 80% of Canadians know that there's no place for these guns in our, in our society. Okay, so let's skip ahead here. So Bill Blair is talking about this particular poll from late May, where 82% of Canadians support the federal government's ban on military-style assault weapons. So Ipsos has been known to make biased polls before, and it has skewed their data by quite a lot. One quick example, back in 2016, they called the election for a 90% chance of winning for Clinton, and we all know how that turned out. Going back to this poll, so this poll, they only asked Canadians from the major cities. They didn't ask any of the r rural Canadians, um, or typically people would be skewed to not knowing anything about the firearms laws in Canada. And the firearms laws in Canada are fairly complex and comprehensive. So the other thing they didn't explain is that this ban that was passed on May 1st wouldn't have changed the outcome from Nova Scotia. So that guy still would have been able to smuggle his firearms because again, that those are not subject to the laws in Canada because he, he just ignore them. You really have to ask yourself when you hear about these polls or you are being polled yourself, do you have enough information to make an informed, rational choice? If you have no idea or the people that are making that poll have no idea, then that poll is not valid. So they did keep repeating this poll again and again for a while until they sort of stopped because they realized people figured it out that it was in fact a biased poll but it's gonna do a lot more. We're looking at all the ways in which criminals get guns. You know, and for example, the tragedy on the Danforth a few years ago, in which two young ladies, lost, young girls lost their life. That gun, as, as you and I both know, was stolen from a gun store in Saskatchewan. And that gun store in Saskatchewan, that, where, from whom, where that gun was stolen, faced no consequences for that. I want to ensure that every handgun in this country is stored securely. And so we're going to make very explicit rules on, on this. Okay, now we're back to the Den of Four shooter, where in fact the specific handgun used was in fact stolen from a Saskatchewan gun store. And, you know, the Den of Four shooting actually happened in Ontario. So that's quite a ways away. But the thing is, is that that particular household had the previous year been raided and again, had 33 firearms confiscated and the 42 kilograms of uh, car fentanyl. So if they can get access to 33 illegal firearms as, as that family, now again, they haven't said specifically the Danaforth shooter had gang ties, but if the brother had gang ties, 
it seems like he would have access to a few of those contacts who could possibly get him a weapon. The source of this particular weapon was, I would think, pretty inconsequential, especially if they had access to 33 before. If it wasn't that specific handgun stolen from Saskatchewan, it would have been another from, you know, either other, you know, 30 or so that could have been smuggled from the U.S. Because most of the handguns happen to be smuggled from the U.S. That gun just happened to be stolen and I guess moved over a couple of provinces. And that was the gun that was supplied to the to the Danafor shooter. So, th again, they're not focusing on the problem. The problem isn't the criminal who stole, stole the handgun from from the gun store it isn't the problem of that particular gun being sold illegally to the Danafor shooter who had no gun license it isn't the fact that that Danafor shooter um, ended up getting ammo illegally because he didn't have a gun license to do that and it isn't the fact that he illegally carried the weapon without an authority to transport and then walked down the street and then shot a bunch of people again that's all illegal but let's not focus on that the focus is on the safe storage. Safe storage would have would have solved this problem, right? No, it would not have solved the problem. The shooter would have still been able to get a firearm regardless. And like, let's try to focus on some real solution. How about how about this? Stop the bleed. This is a really good option to be able to increase your own just sort of survival skills, your own um, medical skills you know everyone knows CPR but at this point this is the next step stop the bleed I suggest everyone get this training because it will provide a net benefit to you and I mean again it's like a seatbelt you know you hope you never need it but if you need it you have it and the trainer who taught me the stop the bleed also went through the case reports for Danaforth. And the cold hard reality is that the two people who died, the two girls who died, they didn't, they, they died because they got shot. I think one of them was shot in the leg and they bled out. And it took a while. Like it takes a little bit of time to actually bleed out. And the issue is that the ambulances could not get to them. That's the cold hard reality is that during an active situation, an active shooter situation, ambulances will not arrive police will not arrive until they've neutralized the threat. So you're at the mercy to either get out under your own power or you're at the mercy of whatever skills anyone else is close to you has. And unfortunately, no one else in that particular area had the necessary skills to actually stop the bleed correctly. So this is another good option that this would save lives, period. We don't need more laws. We need people who are better trained storage of handguns to stop them from being stolen <clears throat> but we also know many of them are smuggled across the border and, and people want to get into arguments with me all the time of what's the percentage the, fa the fact is it changes over time if you put pressures at the border they, they obtain them other ways but the border is really important and so we've already in the last parliament we made some pretty significant investments at the border and you'll recall last year i was the minister of border security and organized 80 crime some odd million dollars i recall for cbsa that's exactly it was and, and and so we made those investments we put more officers there more dogs x-rays equipment you know and and we also invested 347 million dollars in the police because we know police investigations into the great gangs responsible for smuggling these guns is also really important so Bill Blair just said that he is investing in border security. We definitely support that. We, you know, we need to get a handle on the 80% of illegal firearms entering Canada is coming from the U.S. Uh, legally, and you know he's made comments on on the floor of the House of Commons. Uh, he cited that the you know the the con the Conservative government you know before was slashing funding, and that you know they they are investing 86 million dollars. Now that 86 million dollars is over five years so it's not a crazy amount of money it's actually like and, and again that's over all of canada just like that 347 million dollars he just mentioned is for all of canada over five years which is a insignificant sum for in you know increasing uh, police policing especially with all these calls to defund the police so I actually got a hand on the Canada Border Services departmental plan. So this is their expected budget. So 
I wanted to take a look at something. So this is actually page 26 where they actually go over their border enforcement. So the weird thing is, is that they're investing $86 million on for the CBSA over five years. But over the next two years, they're cutting funding by $390 million. So <laughs> I'm not sure that word means what you think it means. Like when Bill Blair says invest, like, okay, here's $86 million. Can I have my $390 million back? Good intentions don't seem to be manifesting in the actions of the Public Safety Office, the CBSA, or the RCMP. Hey guys, I just want to leave you with just a couple of statistics from Canada. So this is actually official statistics from statscangc.ca. 660 people were uh, killed by homicide in 2017. Now, of that, only 266 people were killed by a firearm. There isn't a lot of people killed by firearm, and four to five people knew their killer. So again, from the 660, like, like you get down to like under, like it's like 60 people that would have not known their, their killer. Canada is actually an incredibly safe country. Okay, let's review Bill Blair's good intentions. So he started off with banning firearms based on looks, not on how they function. He likes to rehash arguments that evoke an emotional response. But when you dig a little deeper, it doesn't seem that Canada is any safer for it. He has defunded the CBSA while claiming he has invested in the CBSA and is focusing on a problem that affects around 50 people per year of which how many of those could have been saved if they had been allowed defensive uses of firearms. So there's a lot to sort of unpack there and that's it. I'm done. This, this video is over. I will leave it for another day. So thank you all for watching. Leave your comments below. Let me know what you think and I'll see you guys in the next one.